there. Um, I have been working on a paper for one of my classes and um, just due to all of the uh, rapid fire Supreme Court decisions that have been made recently, um, I wanted to record this paper, um, even though it's still in the draft stage, um, just because I think it's I think it's really relevant right now. Um, so yeah, I, I just like to share this with you. It's for um, a class that looks at sort of the church state separation and relating to the Supreme Court. It's really interesting. Um, so my paper is called Equal in Essence but Eternally Subordinate in Role, the Implications of a Subordinationist Evangelical Trinitarian Doctrine in a Post-Roe World. So this paper is going to look at a few different things. It's going to look at um, Supreme Court decisions surrounding Roe, the overturning of Roe, the rise of the evangelical um, political right, um, and also the subordinationist Trinitarian imaginings of evangelical theologians. Um, so yeah, I hope you enjoy. I'll start reading now. Roe v. Wade was the landmark Supreme Court decision made in 1973 that upheld a woman's constitutional right to privacy, supported by the liberty guarantee of the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. Of course, Roe is most widely known to protect a woman's right to reproductive autonomy. However, this court ruling highlights both liberty and privacy, two standards that are necessary for placing women in a more egalitarian relation to men. Therefore, the 2022 court overturning of Roe via Dobbs versus uh, Jackson Women's Health Organization demarcates a fraught new era America's entering in regards to not just women's privacy and liberty, but that of the individual as well. So these implications are far reaching and extend into every facet of American life. Perhaps the reverberations will be felt most shockingly in the realm of American religion and Christian theology. So in this paper, I will chart the overturning of Roe v. Wade an act which signals the return of a centralized power dynamic of male dominance, originally um, decentralized in Roe, to legally support the autonomy of women's choice and uphold autonomy and privacy as well. Um, while Roe originally answered the question of autonomy, again, in the realm of women's reproductive health care, this overturning of Roe precedent uh, further solidifies the evangelical desire for the subordination of women to men in realms of both gender roles, power, and bodily autonomy, which further supports and legitimates a subordinationist view of the Trinity. So this paper will look at the legacy of Roe and its importance, subordinationist evangelical theologians, the interplay between subordinationist politics and theology, and also how American Christians can move forward in a world post-Roe. So Roe v. Wade, a landmark decision for bodily autonomy and women's privacy. Roe v. Wade, as mentioned, was the landmark decision that upheld a woman's right to privacy and liberty specifically in regard to procuring an abortion and the barring of a state's interference with this decision. The Supreme Court ruled that at the time, Texas laws which criminalize abortions were unconstitutional and violated a woman's right to privacy under the Due Process Clause. So privacy was declared a fundamental right and states could not limit or prohibit such fundamental rights of citizens. So viability of the pregnancy was also considered in this ruling along with maternity health and also health of the um, pregnancy as well. So, though the ruling made abortion accessibility the law of the land, states could still restrict gestational limits after the first trimester. So, prior to Jackson, uh, the recent ruling, all states in America allowed uh, terminations from essentially six weeks, which is heartbeat bills, um, to over 24 weeks in states like Colorado and Oregon. And despite Roe taking effect in 1973, there have been several attempts to chip away at this ruling. These challenges to Roe include Planned Parenthood of Southeastern Pennsylvania v. Casey in 1992, which established that abortion restrictions were unconstitutional if they placed an undue burden on the woman, uh, Gonzalez v. Carhartt in 2007, uh, which upheld the Partial Birth Abortion Ban Act, um, Whole Women's Health v. Hellerstedt, in 2016, which evoked, invoked Casey, the decision made in Casey, um, to strike down the need for admitting privileges and surgical care center certification that abortion uh, facilities need occasionally, depending on the state. Um, and the 2020 June Medical Services LLC versus Russo, um, which is similar to Whole Woman's Health in that it struck down admitting privilege requirements in Louisiana. So the point of each of these cases was really to challenge the legitimacy of Roe and to continue to chip away at um, abortion access. So with um, the June 24, 2022 Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization ruling, there is no longer a constitutional right to abortion. And so it is expected that half of all states will roll back their abortion ac access with more states likely to follow suit. So while this ruling is egregious and will most likely amount in crushing outcomes, 
uh, in women's health and well-being, maternal care, infant and, and infant and mother mortality rate increases and more. The concern in regard to this paper lies in the constitutional right for women's privacy and liberty. That's being called into question here. So prior to Roe, women frequently found themselves in the position of a second-class citizen. We still do. Um, with little rights protected by law. It was only in 1993 that all states finally removed the marital rape exception from rape laws. So it's critical to share a Supreme Court case that highlights the wide-ranging applicability of Roe that does not directly relate to reproductive health care. So in the case of uh, McFall versus Shimp in 1978, it was ruled that no person could be compelled to participate in the medical treatment of another person, even if it was life-saving. So while this case explicitly dealt with bone marrow transplants, McFall versus Shimp set a legal precedent um, that an individual is not under compulsion to aid another person at their mental or physical expense, upholding the right to bodily autonomy found at the center of the debate on the legality of abortion. And so that's, um, that's a quote from uh, somebody named Alexia Ingram, who is writing for the um, uh, Harvard Undergraduate Law Review. Um, so at the center of Roe is the concern for bodily security, autonomy, and privacy of the citizen. This fight for autonomy and equality has stretched on for the entirety of American history and has deep reverberations, not just within American politics, but religion as well. So subordinationism in evangelical theology. The point of these rulings calls into consideration whether or not a woman's body is her own, whether she is property, either of the state or of her husband. So as this paper makes a critical shift towards the theological and religious, the reader will find deep intersections between um, the politics that seek to restrict and regulate women's bodies and the flawed theology that teaches that women's bodies should be restricted and subordinated. So Kevin Giles, of who I'm going to cite at length here from his work, The Trinity and Subordinationism, has written extensively on the damage subordinationism does not only to evangelical theology, but to the relationship of men to women and the work needed to reclaim or to return to a Nicene orthodoxy for evangelicals. So 19th century theologian Charles Hodge was a firm proponent of a distinction and subordination within the Trinity. So Hodge was also under the understanding that enslaved men and women were subordinated in perpetuity to their masters, which he claims was also supported by scripture. So Hodge was not alone in this thinking when we consider many male theologians and pastors of his time, um, again, the 19th century, uh, that taught that there was a biblical support for chattel slavery. Individuals like James Henley Thornwell and Richard Fuller believed that there was a perpetual inferiority of enslaved people to those who enslaved them. This is critical for beginning to understand the perceived perpetual subordination of women to men that theologians have also found apparent biblical support in. So Hodge wrote, and I quote, order and subordination pervade the whole universe and they are essential to its being. In Kevin Giles' analysis of subordinationist theology, specifically in regard to Hodge, he writes, and I quote, we are thus not surprised that with these social and political commitments, Hodge read back into the Trinity, the fixed hierarchical ordering of the, his cultural setting. It's critical. Um, but this reading of politics into religion and its major theological ramifications is just as relevant today in the consideration of the overturning of Roe. So evangelicals who promote the permanent subordination of women to men often use the words of uh, Louis Burkhoff, an early 20th century American Dutch Reformed theologian who wrote about a certain subordination as to the manner of personal subsistence in the Trinity. So similarly, um, and I'm going to quote here from Giles, George Knight, who is famous in conservative evangelical circles for developing the novel argument that women and, are, women and men are equal in being yet subordinated in role, explicitly speaks to the ontological subordination of the Son in the Trinity. It is his view that the Bible teaches a chain of subordination within the Godhead, which must mean a hierarchical order. And so anything that is happening in the Trinity is reflected in human life as well. So to this extent, evangelicals who follow this chain of subordination reasoning expand uh, on this to their own lives. So when two or more people live or work together in marriage, church, or community, then one person must naturally be in charge. So this sets up the dominant subordinate role dichotomy within the evangelical marriage. So building upon this further, for theologian Wayne Grudem, his equal in essence, but eternally subordinate in role imagining of the Trinity underlines his understanding that men and women are equal, but must conform to different gender specific roles. 
So Grudem is also the founder of the Council on Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, which espouses the idea of complementarianism. And so this is different but equal uh, gender roles, essentially. So it's worth noting that this notion of biblical gender roles and the subordination of the son to the father, in, for that matter, is a modern advent that was not spoken of in this manner prior to the 1970s. This is critical. This was a critical shift. Um, similarly, in regard to church governance, um, Grudem again concludes that his understanding of the Trinity confirms and endorses his view of the differing role of women and men in church. Men have been given the ruling role and women have been given the subordinate role. They are to submit to male headship. And so that's from Giles as well. So Giles writes, and I quote, in regard to human beings, the permanent and necessary role subordination of one sex, race, or social group implies that they are in some way inferior in being. Um, and this is true on the divine level as well. So if the son must always obey the father, then he must in some way be less than the father. He lacks something possessed solely by the father. So this is shockingly in disagreement with the Nicene Creed, which was written in 325, which states that the Trinity is comprised of the same substance. Um, so upon considering the inner life of the Trinity and human relations, these act as a mirror for each other. And so if human relations are subordinate in nature, then theology will mirror this as well. And so Christians will be left with a distorted image of God in the inner relationship of God. What was agreed upon in the Nicene Creed, homoousios, or same substance, is no longer found to be valid in the evangelical imagining of the Trinity. So if therefore Christ can be subordinate to the Father based on the argument of a different substance, then so can woman be sub, uh, subordinate to men in their chronological creation or incomplete creation, um, and therefore find no constitutional protection for her privacy or liberty. In the evangelical mind, woman was created second in Genesis 2, and so therefore she ranks as inferior to men. Um, this chronological creation has permanently determined both status and freedom to great detriment. Um, I'd also like to throw in here, just kind of as a place marker, that Adam and Eve can represent um, land and language as well, not just two distinct persons. So we really need to consider what Genesis is telling us, but I'll save that for another video. So according to the patristic writer John Chrysostom, God made man first to show male superiority and to teach that male sex enjoyed the higher honor, having preeminence in every way. So again, we're going to have to think about the culture and context that John Chrysostom was writing in. And again, I'm going to put this in a, put a pin in this uh, for another video at another time speaking about patristic writers of the early church. So to further corroborate this inferiority of woman in regard to Genesis 3 and Timothy um, and 1 Timothy uh, chapters 2 verses 14, these passages were taken to mean that Eve is to be blamed for all evil and death and that she and all her sex are more prone to sin and error than are men. Women are subordinated as a class or race because Eve is responsible for the fall. And so this is a, um, a very um, interesting sexist um, thread of theology that has kind of gone throughout time. And so that's a quote from Giles. So in light of this, it is often encouraged of women to accept their position in life. And this idea that women are somehow not equally image bearers of the divine and that they are somehow secondary and more prone to sin. These ideas feel highly antiquated. However, this is to emphasize a long trajectory of faulty thought that has led us to where we are today. So women as a class are believed to need men's protection and leadership. And so women are not trusted with their own bodily autonomy. Building upon this, in marriage, it is believed that subordination of wife to husband is not only necessary, but mandated by God. So for women to be set under men. I'm going to shift gears again here to the political rise of the American evangelical. So what is an American evangelical and how has this religious notion become entangled in the political? So evangelicals regularly claim that all of their views come solely from the Bible. This is from Sola Scripture and fundamentalism as well. Um, and that this informs their social and political worldviews. However, starting in the 1970s, again, critical shift in the 70s, right-wing conservative leaders saw a great opportunity in evangelicals and fundamentalists. They were an untapped market uh, for political philosophy. And so this is from a book by Ronald Flowers. It's very interesting. Um, this launched a strategy to get evangelical Christians involved in the political arena, aiming to vote in born again elected officials who shared their biblical worldview for a Christian America. So again, think about the separation of church and state here. 
Similarly, this new evangelical market was being courted by new publishing empires like Tyndale House, which further reinforced the melting of um, politics into religion. So I did a video about the market, um, like marketing um, done by Tyndale House, and it was in a previous video. It's very interesting stuff. So according to Kristen Copes Dumay in her book, Jesus and John Wayne, evangelicalism must be seen as a cultural and political movement rather than as a community defined chiefly by its theology. The fact that Christian evangelicalism now equates to Christian nationalism explains the shift in the 70s toward outright subordinate roles for both Christ and the Trinity and women in society. Similarly entangled in this Christian nationalism is the notion of a um, Christian masculinity. So one that dominates, forces submission, and coerces with the strong arm of patriarchy. So as one begins to examine these astroturfed roots of um, American evangelicalism, it becomes clear how conservative evangelical Christianity and right-wing politics have become so deeply enmeshed. So according to Cope Sumay, and I'm going to quote here, for conservative white evangelicals, the good news of the Christian gospel has become inextricably linked to a staunch commitment to patriarchal authority, gender difference, and Christian nationalism. And all of these are intertwined with white racial identity. This inextricable link is the result of a slow creep of influence over roughly the past century. However, with the vast political power this group currently holds in America of Christian nationalists, we are now um, watching the rollback of constitutional rights that protected both women's liberties and also preserved the separation between church and state and free speech um, via the recent ruling of Kennedy versus Bremerton School District about public prayers in schools. So in the book, Church, State, and Public Justice, um, P.C. Kemeny writes, highlights the resurgence of the religious right, mainly through fundamentalist uh, Jerry Falwell and his founding of the Moral Majority. So this organization worked to merge the interests of Christian fundamentalists and right-wing conservatives, giving a major voice to policy concerns such as the Equal Rights Amendment and the legality of and access to abortion care, among other things. They were very concerned with the moral decline of society. So despite the fundamentalist overtones, the moral majority was also supported by evangelicals and more conservative mainline Protestants, all who had a common interest in social reform, specifically when it came to issues surrounding the family and sexuality and prayer in schools, etc. So after Roe, fundamentalists and evangelicals rallied together in a major way based on their outrage in light of the court decision. So Pat Robinson, a Pentecostal televangelist, went on to form the Christian Coalition, which is a conservative evangelical lobbying organization um, that still exists today, just in a different form, that voices its concern over social reform. So these are only a few examples of the melding of religion into the political. Um, however, it serves to illustrate the point that directly due to Roe and the Equal Rights Amendment, Christian outrage over and against society has boiled over into a culture war at this point. So reclaiming the egalitarian trinity and reclaiming equality. As American Christians move forward in a world post-Roe, it is very easy to feel disheartened by the interwoven complexity of conservative evangelical theology and theological illiteracy, um, and married to the overwhelming right-wing political power that exists in America, along with the deeply enmeshed belief in women's subordinate roles to men. So where once Roe upheld women's privacy and bodily autonomy, now we are left to reckon with the ruling of that women's bodies are not their own. And also that uh, the right to privacy is null. So it's critical to um, understand that seemingly unlimited power wielded by the Christian right is a minority held view among American Christians and presents a period of distinctly disproportionate minority rule. So in considering that evangelical theology continues to uphold the faulty understanding that the son is eternally subordinate to the father, deep-seated issues of patriarchy, hierarchy, and subordination come to rise. It's no accident that this faulty theology goes hand in hand with how evangelicals imagine the world for women. This understanding of a hierarchical trinity is diametrically opposed to the orthodox teaching of the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed, which states that the son is consubstantial with the father. So since the early church and initial development of Trinitarian doctrine, Arianism has been refuted. And the Trinity has been understood as three persons in one, a per perichoretic egalitarian relationship. So the total dependence on scripture with a refusal to acknowledge tradition has led American evangelicals into the quagmire of their own making. 
So to move forward and out of this death spiral, modern evangelicals must consider the long-held teachings of an orthodox Trinitarian doctrine. So only when it can be imagined that God is relational and also in relation can American Christians move toward um, egalitarian relationships with others, leaving behind the gender, race, uh, sex, and class hierarchy. An egalitarian understanding of both the Trinity and the greater world will yield a deeper respect for bodily autonomy and security, personal liberty, and privacy. All right, that's all I have today. Um, thanks so much for listening. Uh, I really appreciate it, and take care.